Okay, so I'll begin. Um, so, oh, that's incredibly loud, but anyways. Um, so, I, academic skepticism is something that can be a bit obscure if you don't do ancient philosophy, or even for some people who do do ancient philosophy, depending on their specialization. So, I've kind of added in some, some background information in this talk as well, which I hopefully, which will hopefully be a little elucidating. So I hope I don't lose anyone in doing that. Um, anyways, so I'll start now. Um, the main challenge in writing about academic skepticism is the complicated nature of the evidence. Uh, in the case of Arcesilaus and Carneades, the two main figures of academic skepticism, it appears neither actually ever wrote anything down. This leaves us with third or fourth hand accounts of what they might have thought, which are probably more representative of what others thought of them rather than what they thought themselves. The evidence is also typically very temporally removed from the, from the source. Uh, Cicero, for instance, wrote about 150 years after the time of Arcesilaus. Sextus Empiricus was writing nearly 300 years after that. Further, our main sources on academic skepticism are Sextus Empiricus, Cicero, Diogenes Laertius, and Plutarch, all of whom are notorious for misrepresenting their subjects in order to promote their own agendas. For example, Cicero is a student of Philo of Larissa, who is the last known head of the Skeptical Academy. Because his, his own personal intellectual lineage could be traced back to Arcesilaus and Carneades, it was in Cicero's interest to present them in such a way that they seemed to legitimate his views on skepticism. Sextus Empiricus, alternatively, had every reason rhetorically to try to distance himself from the academic skeptics and point out that their theories were not true skepticism like Pyrrho's. So in addition to the problem of reliably transmitting accounts over many years, those who are giving the accounts themselves have questionable motives for doing so. Given this, the best we can do is come up with a likely account of what they might possibly have been thinking. I'll be focusing exclusively on two heads of the academic academy, Arcesilaus and Carneades. Arcesilaus was the first head of the Skeptical Academy, dubbed by Sextus Empiricus the Middle Academy, and known for bringing the skeptical position to the school in the first place. Carneades was the first head of the New Academy and was a very influential thinker for later academic skeptics. We have a reasonable amount of historical evidence concerning them, and they are thought to have been the most influential thinkers of the school. In addition to this, although we will see that each developed their own particular philosophies, they had similar motivations and I think similar methodologies that make it useful to group them together. For the sake of time, I won't delve any further into the extent to which the various academic skeptics were following the same project, but just focus on Arcesilaus and Carneades. By comparing what the various sources say about Arcesilaus and Carneades, we can identify some of their views and methodologies with a relative amount of certainty. So first, we know that they are primarily concerned with undermining the Stoic epistemology, which claim that truth originates in a graspable or cataleptic impression, and that absolute certainty is possible if one has some sort of privileged access to wisdom. Second, the academic skeptics, in contrast to the Stoics, disavowed all knowledge claims and refused to assent to anything. And third, they engaged in Socratic question and answer style dialectic, often with a Stoic interlocutor. Why and how they did these things, however, is still very much open for debate, and there's a good bit of potential for disagreement in the evidence. One of the more persistent interpretive problems surrounding academic skepticism is whether or not the academic skeptics defended any positive philosophical account, and if they did, how this could be consistent with their claim to withhold all assent. Typically, there have been two main methods for reconciling these views. The first method is to argue that the academic skeptics supported some kind of belief that stops short of making knowledge and truth claims. In this case, skept the skepticism at hand is really a claim to epistemic modesty. The second method is to argue that they did not support any positive view at all, but rather that they only engaged in providing counter-arguments to their interlocutors with the aim of forcing them into a state of aporia, which is often described as a state of perplexity or confusion or a suspension of belief brought about by that state. Anything that we see in the evidence that might look like a positive view in this case is just a counter-argument, is not actually a view held by the skeptic. In this case, the academics would be following a fairly radical form of skepticism, fairly reminiscent of the Peronist strategy. Um, today, I'd like to present an alternative interpretive strategy that attempts to reconcile the academic commitment to not assenting with their also having a more positive view on what it is that we do have in place of knowledge and truth claims. And I'll try to keep my language straight in doing this because sometimes it's not quite that easy. Um, 
I'll argue that rather than defending something belief-like, the academics were arguing that we simply don't need belief for most of our activity as humans. Most of human experience occurs within a backdrop that we don't question, and as such, we do not find ourselves needing to assent or have opinions about it. Although inevitably there are problematic instances where we have to reflect on something, these scenarios themselves also do not require belief. Rather, in situations where something gives us cause to doubt it as being out of the ordinary, we test it in some way to see whether the situation that presents itself is in fact problematic. If it is problematic, we do not act in accordance with it. If on further investigation it turns out not to be problematic, we do act in accordance with it. As such, when this is the case, we do not have to have any particular positive beliefs about the matter at hand beyond whether or not they cohere with what we tend to find not problematic. This results in a scenario where we either go along with something that presents itself or we do not, where we do not assent to, to whether or not something is the case or really have much of a positive idea of the matter at hand, but only an idea of what, to what extent it is problematic or questionable. In order to develop, to develop this idea further, I'll first briefly describe the Stoic position on assent and its necessity for action. And then I will look at the academic responses to the Stoic view of assent. And finally, I'll discuss how it is possible to reconcile their positive view with their critiques of Stoic epistemology. So I'll begin with the Stoics. Um, according to the Stoics, the criterion of truth is the fantasia calepticae, which translates directly as graspable presentation. It is an impression that arises from that which is, is stamped and impressed in accordance with that very thing, and of such a kind as could not arise from what is not, um, according to Sextus Empiricus. The graspable presentation is supposed to be so clear and directly of the thing it represents that it cannot be anything but true. The Stoic also thinks that we have a commanding uh, deliberative faculty that allows us to withhold assent from things that don't appear to us to be true. If we're good at exercising this faculty, that is, if we are wise, we will not assent to anything but graspable presentations. Those of us who are not wise, however, will have a more difficult time discerning between cataleptic impressions and impressions that we don't have cause to be so certain about. For instance, in the case of some optical illusions, the famous example is the bent appearance of a straight stick in water. Although the cataleptic impression is the criterion of truth, whether or not we benefit from it relies on whether or not we have the ability to see it for what it is. Because of this, the Stoics have different criteria for truth and knowledge. That is, though they are related, having access to truth will not make you a knower, even if being a knower means that you will have consistent access to truth. Knowledge has the added benefit of being um, secure, firm, and unchangeable by reason, according to Sextus Empiricus. This seems to be some internal state of the knower to have the capacity to identify what ought to be assented to. The knower is in a state of such certainty that there is nothing perceptual or argumentative that could dissuade her. The security brought by a state of knowledge means that the wise person will never assent to anything that is not a graspable presentation and therefore will never make any mistakes. Although we might be able to identify graspable presentations without wisdom, we won't be able to do so reliably or with confidence. Um, and there, there's that internal aspect as well, which seems to be really important to the Stoics. You have, there's this notion of having confidence in what you know that seems to be very important to the wise person. So, uh, the graspable presentation plays an important role in the Stoic account of action as well. So, um, in the, uh, I think, fourth quote on the handout, uh, it should be by Origen, um, it reads, um, of moving things, some have the cause of movement in themselves, while others are moved only from the outside. The latter comprise things which are transportable, like logs and stones and every material thing which is sus sustained by tenor alone. Animals and plants have the cause of movement in themselves, and so quite simply does everything sustained by physique or soul, which they say also includes metals. Some things of this kind they say are moved out of themselves, and others by themselves. The former comprise soulless things, the latter ones which are ensouled, and sold things are moved by themselves when an impression occurs within them which calls forth an impulse. A rational animal, however, in addition to its impressionistic nature, has reason which passes judgment on impressions, rejecting some of these and accepting others, in order that the animal may be guided accordingly. According to the Stoics, human action has three phases, um, and we, we see this in, the, in this quote. So first of all, you have impression, and then once you've experienced an impression, you give assent to whether or not this impression is in fact the case, and if it is the case, you act upon it. 
So our desire to act is first aroused, yeah, by impression, there we go, sorry. As such, all human action requires rational deliberation, even if only on a minimal level. There is nothing we do not do without weighing whether or not something is the case and judging it to be or not to be the case. While it is beyond the means of this paper to delve into the finer points of Stoic ethics and their thought, without this con constant rational action, we'd find ourselves in terrible ethical trouble as we'd not be able to have an account of the relation of virtue and decision making. This would make it impossible to have a concept of a life well lived. We would be little more than irrational animals. Further, it would, be, it would radically undermine the entire Stoic enterprise. If you cannot attain self-mastery, which requires a necessary connection between our rational functions and our actions, there is no point in seeking out knowledge or virtue in the first place. Um, so now I will look at the academic response to this notion of assent. Um, the academics undermined the Stoic position in several not unrelated ways. The first method was to undermine the reliability of the Stoic conception of knowledge. This led to a further attack on the Stoic concept of action, and I'll discuss each in kind. So Akesilaus is reported to have made a rather clever argument to this effect that came in two steps. For the sake of time, I'll not read out the extensive quote, but the fourth block quote, I think, on your handout, it's by Sextus Empiricus, um, has a following series of arguments that make up this first step of argumentation. So um, I'll divide it into three sections. So the first argument um, going on there is that uh, cognition and assent to a graspable presentation are carried out by both uh, the average human operating on mere opinion and the stoic sage operating with a state of knowledge. This seems to be a point um, to the effect that the content of knowledge and true belief is in no way fundamentally different. Um, so even though you have a knower and you have somebody with mere opinion, they're, they're in fact referring to the same thing. Um, so the, the second stage of the argument is that the act of assent is something present in human language rather than in the truth of the cataleptic impression itself. This seems to serve the purpose of driving a wedge between the act of assent and the cataleptic impression. They are not, in fact, of the same kind of thing and do not go so naturally hand in hand as the Stoics would have it. And then on to the third stage, um, Arkesilaos argues, there is no true impression that cannot in some way turn out to be false. He seems to state this as some sort of phenomenological fact. If this is the case, because knowledge requires both assent and a cataleptic impression, there is no way of being entirely certain of the veracity of the cataleptic impression, and there can be no knowledge. While this point is really more of a flat contradiction rather than an argument against the Stoics, it is perhaps not a bad idea at this moment to remember that at this point the Stoics have not presented much of an argument for the existence of wisdom and knowledge beyond that it is desirable to their notion of virtue. Is in this case possible to read this as a criticism of the Stoics to the effect that they are simply not explaining actual human epistemic experience and that there is little point in doing otherwise? Um, like, for instance, I don't know about any of you, but I've never really met somebody who thought they were always correct, who in fact always were correct. Um, I don't know if, the, I, th I think they're pointing out that this is pr probably not something that actually exists. Um, yeah, anyways. At this point, Arkesilaus seems to have done a fairly good job of decimating the Stoic concept of knowledge. There is no difference in content from opinion. There does not seem to be a secure connection between the sage's ascent and this cataleptic impression. And furthermore, it just doesn't seem to be making an adequate description of lived human experience. He concludes from this that the Stoic's notion of the cognitive, that is the state of knowing, does not exist. Given this, the Stoic sage does not in, any fa does not in fact have any privileged access to a certain epist epistemic state. Arkesilaus then makes his rather famous argument to the fact that if he cannot have any privileged access to an epistemic state, the Stoic sage will in fact not assent to anything. This is because if he were to assent to something, he would only be in a state of opinion, and a sage cannot assent to mere opinion according to the Stoic definition of a sage. As such, the Stoic sage will have to withhold all assent if he wants to remain a sage. Which is quite a cute little argument. Anyways, um, so now I'll move on to um, the academic skeptic arguments against the Stoic notion of action. And I think that within this movement, there's also a positive account going on of, of what they think we do in fact have access to instead of this. Um, so this leads to the second way in which the academics undermine the Stoic position. By undermining the Stoic account of action, their line of argument 
to this effect allows some insight into how humans can and do in fact function without knowledge claims. This argument is typically, typically cashed out as a dialogue that began be between Arcesilaus and Zeno of Citium, the founder of Stoicism. Both were reported to have studied at the academy, and both made claim to Socratic heritage. It is said that in response to Arcesilaus' critique of ascent, Zeno pointed out that without some sort of reflective conscious component to their epistemic account, the academics would be unable to give an adequate ex explanation of how and why we act. We would become little better than unreflexive animals, simply reacting irrationally to our environment and completely incapable of anything resembling knowledge or virtue, which they found very problematic. I argue that in addition to having the above critical stance towards the knowledge claims of the Stoics, the academics had a positive account of what kind of epistemic, in the contemporary sense, uh, state we do find ourselves in, in the absence of Stoic wisdom, and that this formed the basis of their response to Zeno's argument from inaction. I'll discuss Arcesilaus's and Carneades' positions separately because they are quite different, but I do think that they have some similarities and similar motivations that I'd also like to tease out. The basic similarity that they seem to hold is that they point out that generally and for the most part, we really do have no need of the higher order reflection the Stoics thought so necessary for right action. We simply do not pause and reflect on every action we make in the day-to-day -day business of life. Rather, we tend to just go along with things as long as they don't strike us as particularly problematic and place a great deal of trust in our environment. As can be seen with closer inspection of the fifth block quote on the handout, there's a lot of reference, if you can see it in this lighting, I'm not really sure what's going on there. Anyways, um, there's a lot of reference to what is natural and ordinary occurrences that we simply do not question. Uh, for instance, a bath is a bath and a door is a door and it's rarely otherwise. Of course, I could be wrong about the door or the bath, but I'd be incredibly surprised if a bath turned out to be something else if I was in a bathroom. I would not be surprised if I walked into the bathroom and noted that, the, that there was a bath and went through a series of complex assessments about the likelihood of a bath occurring in a bathroom that turned out to be wrong. I would be surprised because the existence of a bath in a bathroom is thoroughly unremarkable, and I've never had to reason until now to think of a bath as possibly deceptive. We are affected by impressions of things, but this effect on us is irrational. They actually use the word elogos, uh, according to Plutarch's account, at any rate, or perhaps pre-rational, as this is the sort of experience we typically have before we find ourselves needing to reflect on something. It is unclear in this passage what exactly is meant by falsehood being engendered by opinion, but the most likely interpretation is not that things are true prior to higher order reflection bringing in false distinctions and analysis, or something like this but rather that without this reflection, there is nothing that can be false. Without assent, you simply do not have any falsehood to process, and as anything, that strikes the act, as anything that strikes the actor is potentially false or out of the ordinary, simply not acted upon. However, this leaves the academic skeptics in the position where they need some sort of criterion to determine when to act in difficult cases, and it needs to be a kind of criterion where it can somehow defensively fall behind or below a kind of belief or assent. According to a number of reports, Arcesilaus and Carnides did support some kind of criteria for differentiating good from bad cases. Although there are varying reports about whether or not Arcesilaus and Carnides actually supported such a criterion, and whether or not this was in fact just a rhetorical argumentative ploy against the Stoics, it is interesting and worthwhile to weigh the evidence in favor of them holding such a positive view. According to Sextus Empiricus, Arcesilaus argued, um, and I'm referring to the sixth quote on the handout here, one who suspends judgment about everything will regulate choice and avoidance and actions in general by the reasonable. The reasonable has the attendant benefit of causing us to have right actions, which are prudent, and because they are prudent, lead to a certain amount of happiness. There are a number of candidates for what the reasonable could be. However, I suggest given how Plutarch previously characterized the academy, one candidate could be some sort of weak form of coherentism, whereby we act on something if it fits with what has served us well up until now. I, think with reflective, uh, I can think with reflective confidence that I can walk through that door and bathe in my bath, because they behave as doors and baths have previously, in my experience, acted. In this sense, a reasonable could function as a number of background assumptions that we assimilate throughout our lives based on experience or irrational affectations, as Plutarch puts it. They inform how we act, but we simply tend not to reflect upon them. Alternatively, if I were to try to pour a bath and the water has a color that did not fit my previous affectations of water, I might avoid it and shower at the gym. 
This is not to say that we necessarily find ourselves always avoiding the new or the out of the ordinary, but that we'll choose to avoid the out of the ordinary on occasion, depending on previous experience, good and bad, that we might not even be directly aware of when we make these decisions. If I see that the color of the bathwater is odd, I don't begin to think of all of the instances I've seen bathwater and compare this with, with each of those instances. I'm just aware of the, that this is out of the ordinary, my usual, ex, uh, my usual experience, and avoid it. Carneades is well known for having a slightly more complicated system than Arcesilaus, but I want to argue that they function relatively similarly, though Carneades at face value does seem to be in more danger of arguing for a kind of belief. Carneades argues that there are essentially three criteria for action. We act according to these criteria depending on how important the information we need to navigate a situation is. The more important the situation, the more criteria we employ to limit the chances of an impression not being as it seems to us. First, we act according to what is convincing, so he uses the word pithanon. Um, Sextus, and against the professors, characterizes this as what appears to us to be apparently true. Anything that does not appear true to us is not convincing. This can be something that appears immediately false, or something that appears false but is actually true. Um, because he does seem to think that there are true and false things, but that they're only true and false until we start thinking about them, in which case, when we're thinking about something, it can only be apparently true or apparently false. So there seems to be this kind of appearance-reality distinction going on there. Um, the convincing is no actual truth requirement because we're always in a position of being potentially in the wrong. It can be thought of in terms of Akasalaus as reasonable criterion. It is something that strikes us as, as immediately unproblematic. Um, Sextus writes, yet the rare occurrence of this one, I mean the impression which counterfeits the truth, is not a reason for distrusting the impression, which tells the truth for the most part. For both judgments and actions, as it turns out, are regulated by what, by what holds for the most part. Most of our immediate judgments in our quotidian lives are based on immediate and unreflective assent. Second, we act according to what is uncontrovertible. When we take up an impression, it is rarely in isolation. Sextus uses the example of a man. When we perceive a man, we perceive both him and his extraneous circumstances, such as his hair color, dress, the way he moves or speaks. When all of these impressions seem to support one another, that is, when there isn't anything out of order that would lead us to believe we're mistaken, we take this impression to be more firm than the more, uh, more direct convincing impression. This does not mean that we have any positive beliefs about what is the case, however. Although the situation has involved conscious reflection on a matter, we haven't constructed any positive ideas about the impression itself beyond the fact that we can be a little more comfortable that it is not misleading us. Our reason for thinking it is not misleading is not a belief that the impression is any particular thing, but rather the situation that there is nothing yet ruling it out. Finally, there's the thoroughly tested impression. This impression builds upon the incontrovertible impression by examining it more thoroughly. Sextus uses the example of examining a potential political appointee to see if she is worthy of her appoint appointment. In this case, we examine the circumstances in which the impression was made and whether they are favorable. The lighting, for instance, or the distance, the facilities, the, per the faculties of the person making the impression he uses as, as examples. Whether it seems like it might be insane or not, and so on. Again, Carneades seems to have been supporting a negative form of investigation. Rather than putting forward positive hypotheses about the nature of the impression at hand, he's looking to see if there is any reason to discredit it. If there is no reasonable evidence to its contrary, there is no reason to not continue as though the impression were true. If it appears problematic, do not act according to it. Regardless, in neither of these situations is the actual true status of the impression investigated. It is assumed to be true until shown to be otherwise. There are, I think, several interesting conclusions to be taken out of this reading of Arcesilaus and Carneades. I'm coming to my close. Um, so first, they would actually have a much more optimistic view of the human condition than the Stoics, I think. Without some idea of the Stoic sage, the good life becomes slightly more democratic and accessible. If our epistemic states are taken as largely unproblematic, the question of whether or not we can be absolutely certain about how we think about the world is not really an important question. We are fallible, and most of the time when that fallibility is not avoidable, the outcome is not such that it is something much worth worrying about. Indeed, in this light, it seems that the stoic quest for certainty and the undoubtable undoubtable cataleptic impression is self-undermining if its goal is some form of ataraxia. 
as it is preoccupied with a standard of knowledge that, while perhaps not bad to have theoretically, is not necessary and generally not worth the trouble when our everyday non-philosophical interactions with the world typically function just fine. As such, it is probably worthwhile to note that the academic skeptics never referred to themselves as skeptics. This was a moniker later given to them by commentators. Though they didn't agree with the Stoic truth and certainty claims, it is not unlikely that they did not, it's not unlikely that they did not see themselves as skeptics in the sense of someone who doubts any ability to have adequate forms of information at all. Second, the academic way of engaging information would seem to not be bivalent, but rather some spectrum of more or less the case, or perhaps true enough for the present circumstances. Knowledge claims are dispensed with, and it seems that the pragmatic interests of the actor are the main consideration. And it does certainly seem to be the case that for a good part of our practical knowledge requirements, it's not really important whether or not they're universally applicable or understood. If this is the case, perhaps the academic preoccupation with Socratic Alenkis had less to do with the desire to leave others apparatic, as much commentary says, and more to do with the personal and contingent nature of information that makes transmission a very personal enterprise. So, for instance, they would then be working more in the midwife version of Socratic Alenkis um, rather than an apparatic version of it. Um, and yeah, that's a bit of a sudden end, but that's, that's it.